Okay, we're good. Good evening and welcome to the City Council meeting for August 4th, 2020. I want to remind Victoria residents that they can watch City Council meetings live on suddenly channels 15 or 115 on our city website at www.victoriatx.gov forward slash VTV15 or on the city's Facebook page. If you wish to participate in today's citizen communication segment of tonight's meeting, you can do so through a video conferencing option. We have set up this option to limit social gatherings and protect our citizens and city employees from COVID-19. Here's how you access the video conference during citizens communications. www.zoom.com from your web browser and select join a meeting located at the top of your browser and input 444-573-113. Again, 444-573-113 for the meeting ID. Select join followed by open Zoom, then join with convert audio. Click on the icon labeled participants to ask the option to raise hand at the bottom of the screen. When click raise hand, our moderator will announce you by your username you've selected and that will be your cue to begin speaking to council. Comments will be provided with audio only. There will not be an opportunity at this time to share your screen or any additional presentations. Please remember to silence any cell phones, televisions, or other backgrounds so that we can clearly hear your comments. During the citizens communication segment of tonight's meeting, the five minute comment period still applies as it did when citizens were here. Again, we <laughs> ask that your comments be five minutes or less. The inf this information is also posted on our website again at Victoria, V I C T O R I A T X dot gov forward slash TV 15. It is generally the practice of the city council not to respond to comments made during this time, but city staff will be available to follow up as necessary. At this time, I will ask our city secretary to call the roll. Good evening. Councilman De La Garza? Present. Mayor Pro Tim Solis? Councilman Bocknight? Here. Councilwoman Scott? Here. Councilman Young? He's here. He just doesn't respond. Yeah. Councilman Lofgren? I'm here. And Mayor McCoy. I'm here. Did we have an affirmative from Ms. Solis? Yes, I'm here. sir. She's here. Okay. And Dr. Young as well? Yes, sir. Okay, we have all council members present. We do have a quorum. We will continue the meeting of the Victoria Council. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. As always, we want to welcome citizens who are tuned in tonight, and we hope that uh, you follow the meeting and participate as you wish. And now, Mr. Garza, do you have any announcements for tonight? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Just a quick announcement uh, to make you aware and the public aware that we will be having a special city council meeting next Tuesday, August 11th at 5 p.m. Um, this meeting will also take place uh, via Zoom. And the main topics of this council meeting need to officially uh, propose the budget and officially start conversations about the trade. Uh, you may recall from the original budget calendar that we distributed that that conversation was supposed to occur today. Um, but unfortunately, you know, due to some reasons outside of our control, we have to delay that a week. 
And so we will do that um, next week. In the meantime, um, I will more than likely be reaching out to you all individually this week um, to notify you of some of the of, of what that, that conversation will be like next week, um, so that hopefully we can have a more robust um, and successful conversation next week. Um, other than that, though, Mayor, I don't have any other updates. Okay, thank you, Mr. Garza. I don't believe we have any public or employee recognitions tonight, so I'll move on to items from Council. Are there any items not otherwise listed on the agenda for which the members of the council would like to request specific factual information, a recitation of existing policy or placement of future agenda? I just have one thing I wanted to say. Um, last Friday, I was coming down Placido Benavides and right behind uh, Walmart until you get to the subdivision those lights on and it was pretty dark at night. So that area right there is not lighted. I just wanted somebody to check on it, please. Certainly, we'll check Thanks. on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Any other items from council? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mayor, can you? Yes, sir, I can, Dr. Young. Okay, my, my microphone was off, I computer issues. Um, I, Mr. Garza, you may be able to speak to this. I'd spoken with you or had some communications in regards to who is responsible if an accident happens with debris from accidents and right. some information. But is there any way that we can um, maybe explain that to the, to the public and whose responsibility it is so that sure. that debris doesn't end up or storm uh, drains? Sure, absolutely. So the the um, the question or the issue at hand was when there's a car wreck, who's responsible for clearing the debris from the roadway? Um, and and obviously with the concern that if it's not cleared when it rains, that those elements might potentially go into our into our drainage system. And um, it's 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 an answer that's based off of the scenario. If the wreck uh, is of the magnitude where a tow truck comes out, per the permit that the tow trucks get, they are required to pick up the debris. Um, if they do not pick up the debris, they're actually subject for suspension or complete removal of their permit um, for this process. Obviously, for some of the minor accidents where tow trucks aren't called, um, depending on the roadway, meaning if it's a TxDOT roadway, uh, TxDOT would be called to clear the debris. If it's a city roadway, and if it's small enough, sometimes PD and fire departments do it themselves, or if it necessitates calling public works, um, they would call public works. Okay, thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Any other, oh, excuse me, any, any items from council? Uh, I have one, it's not really an item from council, although I suppose it is. Uh, during this time when we're having Zoom meetings, uh, when we have people that speak to us, uh, and example was at our last meeting, where citizens speaking to us, I know that each of them knows their name very well, but it was very difficult to understand some of them. I don't know if we could ask people to please say their name slowly and clearly. And this that I personally would like to know is to, um, to know where they're from, if they're from the city, if they're from where they're from. Uh, but I think, I think for ease of taking the minutes, we could at least ask them to please say their full name very clearly. Duly noted. Any other items? Hearing none, I'll move on to citizens' communication. As a reminder, if you wish to participate in today's citizens' communication segment of the meeting, you can do so through the video conference option. Comments will be provided audio only. There will not be an opportunity at this time to share your screen or any additional presentations. Remember to silence your cell phones, televisions, or other background noise so we can clearly hear your comments. And as Ms. Scott pointed out, if you could clearly uh, say your name and uh, where you're from, we would appreciate it very much. Uh, during this portion of the meeting, the five minute comment period still applies as it did when citizens were here in person. Following city's uh, citizen communication, I'm going to ask council to take up item E1 which is the appointments to members of the planning commission. And as such, I would like to ask anyone wishing to speak at that time on that subject to do so at that time. 
uh, and, and hold your comments until we can address them during uh, deliberation of that subject. Are there any objections from council to moving that forward? Then we'll do so. If not, Mr. Foote, do you have any citizens who wish to speak? Yes, Mayor, I have Dr. Hunt who wishes to speak, so I'm going to allow him to speak. Is, is he here to speak on the appointments? Yes. Ask him to wait until we get to that item. Okay. Are there any other citizens? No, Mayor, I have another citizen wishing to speak. Okay, then uh, Ms. Goosh, could you take us to item E1? Mr. Goosh? Mr. Goosh, I don't think Thomas is hearing. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having some audio trouble okay. right quick. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can you take us to item E1, please, sir? Absolutely. Item E1 is to uh, appoint or reappoint members of the Planning Commission. Mayor, this is your preference. This isn't noted on your script. And so um, uh, April is going to go through the presentation. And what we're envisioning is as she kind of summarizes the applicants, allowing them an opportunity to speak at that time. Right. Yes, Good so evening, we'll Mayor and Council. April and Thomas for the, uh, as we move forward. Good go evening. Ahead. <laughs> Tonight, I have a brief presentation on the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission, uh, if, if you'll move to the next slide, James. The Planning Commission was organized to exercise control over the platting and subdivision of land both in city limits and then the 3.5 mile ET day by adoption of an interlocal agreement with Toria County. The commission meets monthly to review the submitted plats and variance requests to city codes chapter 20 and 21. The commission's duty is to approve the plat that meet, plats that meet the criteria detailed in the city code and may not approve or disapprove plats based on their own discretion. Variance approval is based on the criteria outlined in section 21-16 of the city code. The board is composed of nine members that serve three-year staggered terms. The commissioners may not serve more than two, two consecutive three-year terms. And if a commissioner fills an unexpired term that has less than 18 months remaining, they may serve two additional full terms. So our current members are Brian Rokita, James Johnson, Julia Welder, and those three um, commissioners, their terms ex expire at the end of this month. And then we have Gail Hode, Marianne Wyatt, Brittany Dearlam, Michael Atkinson, and we have two currently two vacancies due to um, resignations. Next slide, please. So we have those two vacancies for unexpired terms and those terms will expire in August of 2022. We have one appointment that will expire in August 2020 and the commissioner is not eligible for reappointment due to term limits. We have one appointment that will expire in August 2020 and the commissioner does not desire to be reappointed. And we have one appointment that will expire in August 2020 and the commission, commissioner is eligible and does desire to be reappointed. It's a little confusing tonight, but we do have five places to fill. We have received applications from the following individuals interested in serving on the planning commission, Vic Caldwell, Raquel Garza, Brian Olguin, Ashley Moulton, Carl Light III, Dr. Derek Hunt, Cynthia Staley, and then Brian Rokita is our commissioner that does desire to be reappointed. So do y'all have any questions on this portion of the presentation? April, I would, I would now um, give an opportunity for the applicants that are tuning in to um, say a few words. It might be prudent for you to take them one at a time and if they're on, they speak and if not, um, you know, they're not. We, we obviously know that Dr. Hunt is on, but I'm not sure if anybody else is. Okay. Um, could Dr. Hunt be allowed to speak now, James? Yes, Dr. Hunt, you're available to, uh, to speak now. Or 
uh, greetings. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. All right. Well, if I'd like to say uh, uh, good evening or good afternoon to uh, Mr. Mayor uh, and to our council members and the city manager, assistant managers, and all the city staff. Um, I uh, try to take less than five minutes, um, but uh, I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity and uh, and and say that I'm very interested, of course, being appointed as one of the uh, commissioners uh, for dealing uh, with planning. Um, I have over uh, 20 years experience with planning and development. I'm currently uh, right now um, dealing with um, empowering and helping people to start business and deal with economic side in my uh, my business. Um, but I'm also invested in being a model citizen to the community of empowering our town that which we live. Uh, I'm invested uh, with family, with everything, um, uh, with my kids that's uh, here in the school districts. And I want Victoria to be a place that is not only known to, uh, to us, but known all over, a um, place to, that has development, that is, is growing economically that is uh, citizen wise and a uh, good place. I'm not really good at talking about myself, um, but uh, I just wanted to take the time to um, to speak and, um, and say that I, I'm willing to serve and, and add to anything I can do to make Victoria greater or better uh, uh, than before. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. I believe Raquel Garza has a request to speak next, please. Hello. Good evening. Um, good evening, councilmen and women, as well as mayor and, and city managers. Um, I'm Raquel Garza. I'm currently employed with our regional workforce development board, and I feel as the city of Victoria being the largest community within the Golden Crescent region, as it continues to grow and develop that we as citizens within the community must make certain that we become the guide for our smaller neighboring communities that we all support. 10 years experience within contract management within both the public and private sector. I've managed multi-million dollar contracts employed in the private sector industry. And while doing so, I oversee many contracts that are land lease contracts. Currently, I sit um, as a member of the GCRP, the REDACT Committee, which is the Regional Economic Development Advisory Committee. I'm actively um, a member of VISD uh, uh, Education Commission. And um, if it as a member of the Planning Commission, I'd like to push for the Planning Commission to seek to ascertain public interest and how to best further the concerns of the community as a well. whole. We must ensure that the interest and development that we provide to the north side of the community is also reflected to the south side of the community. Also, we should seek broad and public involvement within the process and keep all activities accessible and inclusive at all times. As stewards, we must obtain a greater knowledge and awareness of zoning regulations and how they need to be applied effectively in a thorough manner throughout the city at all times. There should be greater comprehension and understanding of all projects and proposals from the other boards and commissions within the city in order to guarantee the development is happening as effectively as possible. Um, I look forward to hearing from you all. Any questions you all may have, I, I would gladly answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I believe Cynthia Staley is now um, asking to speak. Can you hello? Yes, okay, great. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to visit with you. Um, I currently, oh, and I'm Cynthia Staley, and the last name is spelled S T A L E Y. I currently serve at, with, as the president of Golden Crescent Habitat for Humanity. I've been there for 19 years. And as such, I understand the importance of the Planning Commission's role in, subdivide, in overseeing the subdivision of property within the city limits. We have, I understand the platting process because as Habitat, we filed 
multiple plats for different projects. I understand the variance process from my side of it, not necessarily from the planning commission side of it, because we have had to apply variances before. So we are builders of, uh, most of you know what Habitat is, but we are builders of uh, homes for a, a low to moderate income. And we understand the importance of making sure that what we ask our builders to do doesn't place an undue hardship on them. And yet we need to make sure that they're maintaining um, a, a, one, a durable uh, environment for Victoria move forward. So thank you for the opportunity to visit with you. If anyone has any questions, Raquel said, I'm available to answer questions. Thank you, Millie. I believe Ashley Moulton is next. Can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, thank y'all for um, letting me speak tonight. I am Ashley Moulton. I work for a nonprofit here in Victoria, Texas, uh, Billy T. Catan Recovery Outreach. I'm a licensed professional counselor there. Um, I, I uh, basically have no experience in planning, but I am a resident here, a mother of uh, young children with best interest in, in the planning that go on in the city. Um, so my reasoning for applying and be a part of that, um, I feel it's important to be involved and uh, make sure that I have the opportunity to, uh, you know, a voice in what is going on in the city where my children be growing up. Um, additionally, I you know plan on doing uh, being a business owner in the future and and uh, would like to just be involved as much as possible. Um, so I think that is it. If y'all have any questions, uh, I'll be available. Thanks, Moulton. I do not believe there's anyone else requesting to speak at this time. Thank you. All right. Hang on. So, Ms. Tibbish, will you take us on to the next stage of the process? process. Before before we do that, Mr. Mayor, I would just I just confirm if council have any questions for any of the individuals that that spoke. If not, then we can uh, continue on. Okay. I just have a few brief um, instructions on how we're gonna do these appointments and planning. Since we're not in person, that's a little harder uh, this time with so many appointments. Uh, just remember, we do have five appointments to make tonight. Uh, two of those appointments will be for unexpired terms that will end in August of 2022. So two of the three years still remaining. Um, and those are due to those vacant um, positions because of resignations. And then we have two appointments to make for full terms uh, because either the commissioner doesn't want to be reappointed or cannot be due to term limits. And then we have one full term position that we can either reappoint the, the commissioner that currently serves or we can uh, select someone else. So up to you. So the first step we want to do is decide on that reappointment. So um, Mayor, would you um, please ask about the reappointment of Brian Rokita? I would entertain a motion somebody on council does anyone wish to nominate mr okita to be reappointed i will nominate mr i'll make a move to nominate mr okita again to the planning commission i second we have a motion and a second to reappoint mr okita is there any discussion if not all for a vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. oh same sign okay so that fills our our first position. So we have four more to go. So the next thing that we'll take up are the two unexpired terms, which will end in August of 2022. So um, we will ask for nominations. Um, and then after nominations are received, we will vote on each nominee separate if there are more than two nominees, because we do have two spots to fill. So if there are more than two nominees, we will vote on each nominee separately. And the candidate who can first two candidates to receive the majority of the votes will be appointed to those two unexpired terms. And 
we do ask that everyone vote verbally so that we can hear and uh, make the determination. I would entertain those motions from council. Entertain, the, no entertain the nominees. The yes. names for two of the unexpired terms, two people. I move uh, we appoint Stia Staley and Dot Hunt for the unexpired terms. I second it. Right, there's a motion and a second to uh, nominate those two. Uh, is there a third nominee from anyone? Hearing none, I will call uh, for any discussion. Hearing none, I'll call for a vote on those two appointments to the unexpired terms. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say aye. I hear no negative votes. I assume it's a, uh, a unanimous vote. Okay, one last step. We need to fill those two um, full term positions that we have that will end in August of 2023. So we just need nominations for those two spots and we would vote on them separately if need be, or we can vote together if they're nominated um, as last time, or if we get more than two candidates, we'll vote separately and the two that get the most votes will, will be appointed. Uh, 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 entertain the uh, motions for those two permanent appointments or the full term appointments. I nominate uh, Raquel Garza. I to nominate Vic Cobb. And I'd like to nominate Brian Olguin. Okay. Any other nominees? And then I guess we will take a vote. Yes, sir. If we could vote separately on those three individuals, please. It all oh, in so before, before, just a point of clarification, Mayor, and this is probably uh, for April and Thomas, but um, are you wanting them to make these votes as part of a motion, or are you simply trying to get informal votes to narrow it down? No, we to have two, to, to we have get informal votes to narrow them down. To two. That's that's correct, Mayor. The the vote that you're looking for right now is we will take each of the nominees one at a time, in the order that they were nominated. And so the first question is, do we want to vote yes or no on Raquel Garza being on the resolution? And, it, and then we'll move on to the next. Right. So I'll ask all those who wish to appoint Ms. Garza to, I guess, uh, say so, identify yourself. Yes. Aye. Uh, from Jeff. Aye. From Mark. I think I saw three. Yeah. Mayor, you may want to ask if there are any nays. Are there any nays to Raquel Garza? Well, nay from Jan. That, that's a strong term. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> so as I understand it, that is a 3-1 vote with a few abstentions and so that's actually a passing vote her name goes into the resolution well i i don't think we necessarily knew how that would no. go that fair point uh, dr uh, young pardon i think so that's a fair point. like two out of three and then we'll i i, I would almost ask if if we could just write two names down and put it in for camera. <laughs> there you go. I was thinking the same thing, or if we could go by uh, each district and like Mr. De La Garza go first and just get two names and let's tally them up and see where we are, just like we would do as paper ballots. Uh, I, I agree that something different because I, I don't understand how three out of seven would, would move that person onto the back 
Right. I, I understand the confusion, and I, I certainly agree with you. Um, I think when we were envisioning this process, we didn't anticipate that people might abstain from voting yes or no on including people in this on the nomination process. And we're all we're all striving to do the best we can with this uh, technological uh, situation. But Mayor, I, I, I think it's up to you at this point, if you would prefer to use a different method, we could certainly do that. I have those three, if people would just, uh, uh, like was suggested, put the two of those three up. If they could raise it up to their screen and Miss uh, uh, April could count them, would that suffice? We can do a roll call vote at this point as well. I could ask who was voting in favor of Ms. Garza, and then we could do that same with all three um, nominees and then see who has the most, that, that have the most. To be the top two vote getters that would go forward. Yes, sir. Point. Right. And I vote I... once. Can we only vote once? Per person, I would think. If she, are you going to go around for each person or each each council member? In other words, are you going to call me and ask for two names for me, or are you going to start with the name on the list and call for all seven council members? So Mr. Bognight had suggested that you guys each nominate two, if that if that's what you're comfortable with, which was is the same thing you would do in paper in person. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. Just do a roll call, and each of us will give you two names. Sure. I want to so thank we'll start everybody. With... Thank everybody who's applied. It's a different situation uh, and a wonderful situation to have so many qualified applicants, and so uh, yes. we make appointments every year. So. Uh, I want those people to know that. Yes. And I know that many, and we of the, have... many of the applications also have other areas of interest with this as well. Yes. So we'll start with uh, Councilman De La Garza from District 1. Which two names do you wish to um, nominate, sir? Raquel Garza and Vic Caldwell. Okay. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Solis. Raquel Garza and Brian O'Leary. Okay, and, and um, Councilman Botnight? Raquel Garza and Brian Nolgeen. Brian Nolgeen, okay. Yes, ma'am. And, and um, next will be Councilwoman Scott. Uh, uh, Vic Caldwell and Brian Olgeen. Uh, Councilman Young? Uh, Vic Caldwell and Brian Olgeen. And um, Councilman Lofgren, please. I think he's muted. Mr. Lofgren? Raquel Garza and Vic Caldwell. Okay. And Mayor uh, McCoy. Uh, Brian Olgeen and uh, Caldwell. Was the last one Mr. Caldwell? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So, give me one moment to tally that. I believe Mr. Olgeen received five votes and um, Mr. Caldwell received five votes and Ms. Garza received four. So the, the top two would be Vic Caldwell and Brian Olgeen. I move that we uh, appoint Brian Olgeen and Vic Caldwell to the Planning Commission. Second. The, is it unexpired term or maybe Full expired term? Full, Full, Full terms. Full terms. Second. Right, we have a motion and a second to appoint Vic Caldwell and Brian Olgeen to the uh, uh, 
full terms of the planning commission. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I think we have a unanimous vote there. And again, thank. we'd like to thank everybody for submitting your names and, uh, and your comments tonight uh, were well received too. Thank you very much. And now uh, that completes our appointments there. So uh, Mr. Goosh, take us on to items with public hearings. Yes, sir. The first public hearing is on uh, ordinance to amend city code to create a tourism advisory board to provide direction and advice to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. I think we have a presentation. Yes, sir. Um, Derek and Joel will be discussing this item. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I just have a short presentation here on our uh, proposed tourism advisory board. Um, this would be an advisory body made up of uh, individuals from industries within Victoria that uh, are related to tourism um, or have some impact on tourism uh, with their current or future efforts down the road. Um, so uh, just to break it down real briefly, um, the purpose of, of the board uh, that we are uh, proposing. Um, the uh, Tourism Advisory Board, and if you'd like, I could do a screen share. Okay, and James has that, okay. Um, well, the purpose of the advisory body uh, is to assist in promoting tourism and supporting the industries within the city that directly affect tourism. Um, we are to advise a convention visitors bureau on such matters as may be referred to it, including the administration of grant programs, advertising and other activities for the promotion of tourism. Um, and I also wanna note that this will be an advisory body only and shall have no power to contract on behalf of the city or to authorize the expenditure of hotel occupancy tax funds. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, council and yourself and city manager's office have, have the discretion to spend funds. This will be purely an advisory body. Uh, the board makeup, uh, we would have uh, proposing 13 voting members. Um, in, in developing this, we looked at uh, the advisory boards for a number of uh, comparable communities throughout the state, um, just to name a few, including Conroe, Georgetown, uh, San Angelo, just to name a few of the uh, San, San Marcos, uh, similarly sized communities that are similar to Victoria in some ways. Uh, so the 13 voting members, three members would be to represent the lodging and accommodation industry within Victoria two members to represent the, uh, or three members, excuse me, to represent the lodging accommodations industry, two members to represent the arts, one member to represent historic preservation and promotion, one member to represent the University of Houston, Victoria, one member to represent Victoria College, one member to represent downtown Victoria businesses, one member to represent the food and beverage establishment industry in Victoria, one member to represent the retail shopping industry, one member to represent the attractions industry, and then one member to represent the sports and outdoor tourism industry. Uh, it would also include five non-voting ex officio members, which would include the director of the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the city manager or his or her designee, the executive director of the Victoria Main Street Program, the public library, Victoria Public Library Director, and the Victoria Director of Victoria Parks and Recreation. Um, so you, next, you, next step. How do you define the attractions industry? Uh -huh. um, that is a general term for, um, and, and speaking loosely here, you know, we, we don't know if, if these individuals would, would apply or be interested in applying, but uh, family attractions, you think of things like Outlaw Pass or the Texas Zoo, things that don't necessarily maybe fall into arts or, or retail or, or sports, but things that uh, do have a draw uh, for travelers and residents here in Victoria. So uh, when we uh, included that category, uh, we were thinking of those things that are a little more broad that maybe don't necessarily fall into a, a specific category, but uh, do have a stake in our, and have an impact in our tourism uh, industry. So uh, next steps would be to approval of tourism, the uh, tourism advisory board bylaws. 
uh, applications, make the applications for positions available to the public, but we'd also uh, make those well known among our contacts within the tourism industry in Victoria, our travel partners, our tourism partners. Um, and then the next step would be the board appointments. I have a question. If we set up that board initial, would the uh, have to be appointed for the first one year trial? Want to replace the entire board every two years? Yes, yes, Councilwoman Scott. Yes, thank you for that. Um, our our vision on that is to set up that board and uh, working with those members of the board who we. Uh, bring on um, to work with them to see uh, what their preferred method would be if uh, how we could possibly work in staggered terms in the future, staggered uh, 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 positions on there um, and, and how we could work those uh, in there. Uh, so we would work with the, the board members that would be present once we first set up the board. Thank you. I've got some real concerns. I don't know if you'll wait until after this is over about the, the make up how large it is and wait for the discussion hey you want to hey, wait, wait, wait for the public hearing and okay yeah. go ahead Joel oh uh I'm sorry and in Councilman Ballnight, you're talking about how in ter terms of the number of positions that were on there? Yeah, I don't, we'll discuss it when we uh, have a council discussion on it. Mayor, this item is a public hearing, and uh, if we, if there are no other questions from council members at the moment, uh, we'd be ready to entertain any comments okay. from the public if they're available. All right, well, I will now open a public hearing on this matter. Anyone wishing to speak? Uh, Please raise your hand on the mayor. There are no hands raised at the moment. Okay. Seeing none, nobody uh, raising their hand to speak, then I close the public hearing. And I would entertain a motion on the item. So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second on item C1. Now we'll open up for discussion. Mr. Balk Knight. Yeah, so I have a concern. It's an awful large board. Uh, I think uh, it would be our largest one. I can't remember what the um, library is, but I'm wondering if some of those can't be combined. They can rotate between a UHV and a Victoria College rep, or you got downtown Victoria businesses, but you also have the director of the Texas Main Street program. I know that's an ex officio, but sometimes, and you know, in the past, we have struggled to fill positions on some of these advisory boards. Yes, sir. I don't know and, how you uh, get a core. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. And that's something we could definitely take a look at. We do uh, in, in creating that a board wanted to um, include all possible industries on there. Um, so as I mentioned, we looked at a number of what other cities were doing. You know, we kind of also considered uh, how our current hot funds committee is, is set up, which will uh, soon be helping to uh, determine the, the awarding amounts for the uh, applicants. Um, there is, you know, two representatives from the hoteliers on there as well. So we, we definitely wanted strong representation from the hoteliers. Uh, so in creating those the industry segments, we did want to make sure that uh, everybody was um, um, included on there. We weren't leaving any industry sector out, industry sectors out. So uh, that did account for those those higher numbers there. Yeah, and and I can I can speak just really briefly to um, what might help is just getting a sense of some of the things that this type of group would dive into. Um, these types of groups and other communities typically are large like this, because as Joe mentions, there are so many facets and so many different sectors that fall under tourism. I mean, if we think even just from a legal standpoint on what those monies can be used for, from marketing to historic preservation to the arts, you know, there's so many different elements that, that come into play with that. And so ultimately we envision this group being one that is talking about 
how we utilize some of these funds. Um, you know, we kind of ad hoc have almost had a committee like this. It just gets appointed every year. And so long term, we'd like this formal committee to eventually take over that process so that you don't have to appoint a new review for the applications every single year. Uh, we envision the group uh, talking more about some transformational efforts in terms of how we can enhance tourism in our community. One of the big things that we hear from folks is that we don't do as good of a job as we can on tying in historic, our historical past with our tourism efforts. And so this group can kind of help with the, uh, to that end. Um, it's not uncommon for communities sometimes to enter into strategic planning efforts, even if they're handled in-house. Strategic planning effort on how to go about improving um, um, our tourism and our marketing. And so this group will kind of help drive some of that conversation. And so that's why we were wanting to kind of incorporate um, folks from as many different entities as we can. Um, soon you'll hear about the Parks um, Commission. And we are embarking on a similar path with Parks Commission where we want to empower that group a little more to be involved with the Parks Master Planning process. And so we just feel that there's benefit in having more, I guess, stakeholders involved. Um, we can give it a go. And if we run into issues of not being able to appoint people, I mean, we can always change it. We can always narrow it down. Um, but the, we think it's important to incorporate different folks from different sectors as part of that conversation. I think that maybe we could use the funds members. You already have five people there that are doing this type of work. Why could we start with them and then incorporate the rest of the people in that we, you're looking for? Because I thought that you were going to replace the Hot Funds uh, Committee with this committee. That's when I first did it and everything. Right. So if well, everybody's it's going to think in long term, they're going to use the same committee to do the reviewing of the applications for Hot Funds would it be a good idea to start with them? On your first point, you're correct that this board will eventually take over that responsibility. But for this specific cycle, we, there's just not enough time. There's not enough time for us to establish the board, solicit formal applications, and then have the formal appointments to the board. And so th th this year, it will be a little weird because we're, in essence, asking to create this board and then literally in a few council items we're going to talk about appointing the group of people that help review the applications for this next fiscal year but in the future you're right in that the board will kind of partake in that now i wouldn't put it past the five individuals that get involved with the review of the applications in terms of they're, they're probably going to want to be part of the larger board um, there are other people that joel meets with on a regular basis through a partnership meeting that that they have and so some of those players will probably submit to be part of the board um, we just want folks in our tourism industry to feel like they're, they're part of our overall effort. Um, and so being part of the board can help towards that end. If y'all think y'all can manage it. Okay. Is it, yeah. I've got the same and concerns. I can, you know, it, I'm getting some feedback. Does it make any sense since it's an advisory board? create a board that's a that is a range of members anywhere from like 12 to 18 from these groups so that it kind of becomes organic in the way if you get a lot of interest at a certain time you you try to uh, uh, get members from each one of these uh, sectors but it's more flexible in how you fill it And yeah, then we all can the always, applications would come to council, and that way we're not struggling to try to find however many people it is, you know, all these people. The ex officio members are kind of defined, but, but, uh, and we just fill them from a minimum of this number to a maximum of that number. It's right. like that makes sense. I'm kind of looking at something like that and and thinking instead of it being three members here and one member here, because so many of us in Victoria wear more than one hat and you could serve on this board and really represent more than one industry that perhaps it would be something like no more than, and I guess it's just for those, uh, for the lodging industry and the arts, because if we kind of leave the number a little bit loose, I don't want to get it lopsided but that gets into the minutia. So 
I can't quite get that all figured out in my head. I thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, no, that's a good thought. Um, you know, if, if 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 council feels that that might be a concern in terms of the size of the group, I mean, we can certainly reevaluate the makeup um, of that. And so that's not a problem. I mean, technically this has to come back anyway. Um, and so there's always an opportunity for us to come up with options. Yeah. The funds committee, they spend a lot of time and Thomas can uh, tell for sure, but so I remember spending a lot of time when they go through this and thinking, trying to get all those people to together. I think it's tough enough for the Hans to get together enough. Perhaps, uh, and, and, and I recognize that other boards have been a challenge, um, but I would also suggest that, you know, that we kind of just look at it uh, from, a from a different lens um, because there are a large amount of people that are very involved with the tourism industry. Um, we, like I mentioned earlier, you may or may not be familiar that Joe hosts quarterly partnership meetings um, that literally have dozens of people from our different um, tourism sectors. Um, we also obviously have the annual, it's a smaller group, but we've got the annual group of folks that review the applications. We don't personally foresee an issue in terms of not being able to fill the board. Um, and so we can always try it. And if it doesn't work, we can adjust it or we can look at options now and, and, and just bring it back to council when it comes up um, and just present those options next time. Other cities have similar boards with a lot of members. I think we should go forward with the proposal and see how it works out. We can always adjust it down the road. We're trying to get to the minutia here. And I think they've presented a good plan. Let's forward and see how it goes. And, and as a counsel. point of reference, I was just going to add that as a point of reference, even though this isn't a board that's appointed by council, the Main Street board is made up of about 13 individuals. Um, and so that board itself is, is, is pretty large compared to some of our others. Um, I think big picture, part of the reason why sometimes we probably struggle to, to gain interest is that sometimes we, we um, don't do a great job in really identifying what the mission and the objects are of the board and could be better at engaging the public. And I think if we're more clear with the purpose and we're more clear with the objectives and are actively proactively engaging with the community, I don't foresee there being an issue. Um, and we can talk more about that when we talk about the Parks Commission, because I think that's an example of of a board that can be difficult to fill because there's just a lot of questions about what does that board even do and what are they responsible for? And so I think if we're just clear with the objectives um, and have somebody actively working with these folks, I don't think it'll be a problem. Um, well, I guess in reality, if, if, you, if you put out the applications, you don't get any from those individuals, you just simply don't fill those positions. Right. I mean, does um, that work? And, and I that's why I'm trying to put a minimum. And, right. and we have a deal where you're trying to get advocacy, which a lot of this is in motion of the city. I think we have to separate that duty from the actual divvying out of the hot funds. Because when you talk about advocacy and promotion of the city, sometimes the large numbers are to your advantage. Right. Um, and so to give, to give you an example, so oftentimes communities have, have conversations about the, um, uh, the hotel tax rate. Um, and oftentimes, you know, when people are having conversations about transformational initiatives in the tourism world, um, the people that would more than likely have issues with A, how those funds are collected, B, how those funds are spent are obviously the people in the tourism industry. And so this will provide us uh, an official sounding board to run through different ideas and get these people engaged early in a process so that if at some point there is some transformational initiative or idea that comes out, um, it's vetted through the stakeholders ahead of time and we have their support. Because I've seen it happen in other communities where sometimes cities embark on a significant effort that utilizes motel tax dollars 
and doesn't really include the stakeholders and, and then it backfires because oftentimes these stakeholders have good relationships with elected officials, they have good relationships with, with, with other uh, community leaders. And so having them on board with whatever we decide to do and whatever vision we establish for how to use those dollars is gonna be critical to its success and its, impl and its, in its implementation um, in my mind. Um, you know, even something as simple as talking about a visitor center, right? We want to make sure that, you know, if we are going to have a conversation about adequate location for visitor center, that we actually include those stakeholders that actually see these visitors um, and we get some input on, on that experience. Well, I don't have a problem trying it, you know, it's can never beat us. We ought to shoot for the best we can do. And, uh, you know, if it does work, stop doing it and revisit it. So that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm leaning right now. And great. So, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor of item C1, say so, saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Mayor, before we move on to item C2, just as a point of order, I don't believe we had a final vote on the last item we did, the planning commission. I believe what we did was to nominate people to fill in the blanks on the resolution, but then never actually voted on the resolution as a whole. That's and so if you don't mind, Mayor, I'd like to go back to that item, which was E1 to appoint or reappoint members to the Planning Commission. And it might make sense for the public to follow along easier if April were to reread the list of nominees that are actually on the resolution now that we completed the nomination of. And then you could entertain a vote to approve that resolution with those names filled in. I think we did. Oh, the, the whole deal. We voted individually. Right. Correct. We yeah. voted individually on each member whose name gets put into the resolution. But then we didn't vote on the resolution as a whole. Got you. Okay. Okay. So in the blanks that are on the resolution, you would fill in to reappoint Brian Rokita. The unexpired terms would be filled in by Cynthia Staley and Dr. Derek Hunt, and the two full terms would be filled by uh, Vic Caldwell and Brian Olguin. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to affirm our earlier independent votes. So <laughs> any discussion? Hearing none, all those ever say aye. 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 Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. That takes us to item C2, which is an ordinance to amend section 2-97 related to the Parks Commission's purpose and approve the bylaw. I'm sorry, not and approve the bylaw, related to the Parks Commission's purpose and bylaws. Jason's going to keep me straight here in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, first of all, I, I have a, a little bit of a summary that I'd like to uh, uh, basically just, just uh, present to you uh, on the background information as well as a quick PowerPoint to help clarify the, uh, the item that's proposed. Um, so the Parks and Recreation Commission was established by city council in November 19th of 1962. Uh, the purpose of the committee was to basically advise council on all matters pertaining to the parks and recreation facilities and areas. Uh, during the first commission meeting that we had um, here in 2020, which was in June, uh, one of the commission items that we had to discuss was the reviewing of their bylaws. Um, and when we were reviewing the bylaws, we found that the commission role didn't necessarily align with an advisory committee description. Um, so we started revising the bylaws and looking at them, and we also noticed that the code needed to be changed as well so that it reflected what, you know, uh, what we needed it to um, so what we have in front of you is a proposed code that re basically removes all the verbiage of the commission bylaws and simply states the updated purpose of the commission. Um, that's what we have in front of you tonight. Uh, this has been discussed with the commission um, in a July meeting that we had, and they do support this. Um, and so with that, I'd like to, to roll into the PowerPoint presentation. 
Uh, this is a, a basically two part. Uh, and so again, to reiterate the, the council established the Parks and Recreation Commission back in 1962, prior to the uh, department being established. So the, the original purpose was to advise council on matters pertaining to acquisition, development, and I wanna emphasize these two, the management and maintenance of the use of parks and recreation areas and facilities. And so uh, our proposed purpose, um, you know, as Mr. Garza had mentioned earlier, uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission, we definitely want them to be heavily involved with the Parks Master Plan. Um, they are, they are going to be, you know, the proponents of, of the plan, proponents of the Parks and Recreation System. And so we, we definitely want to, to look at their purpose and change it to, to match that, that accordingly. And so what we're proposing is, is this purpose basically to advise the Parks and Recreation Department on matters pertaining to planning the acquisition of park and recreation area and facilities, the development of parks and recreation areas and facilities, and other items determined by the director. Now, we are talking about the purpose in the code. And so when we present this code to you tonight, the city council still approves the bylaws for the commission which governs the commission. And so our code is, our bylaws are interweaved with our current code. And so we're, again, we're looking at establishing a new code that removes all of that bylaw language and basically simplifies the code. The bylaw part of it is we're, we're proposing a more advisory role for the bylaw and the purpose of the commission. We also included updated language uh, for electronic meetings and voting in the bylaws. So again, two separate things, the code and the bylaws, and, and we're, we're presenting the code to you uh, tonight. Um, the timeline on what we would typically look at for this um, is tonight, obviously, the first reading of the proposed code, which again, during our uh, two weeks ago when we had our Parks Commission meeting was, um, basically accepted by the, by the commission, they, they supported this change. Um, so if all goes well tonight, we'll be looking at presenting the bylaws to the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, during our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting, which would be August the 10th. Uh, so the commission could then vote on those bylaw amendments. Uh, again, if it all works out, August 18th, we would be coming back to city council for a second and third reading of the code and then present those bylaw amendments that the commission had, uh, had approved or, or accepted during that previous meeting. In September, we would look at having city council appoint the entire Parks and Recreation Commission. Now, we have, we have had a little difficulty with this. Uh, the commission hasn't met, in essence, for a year. Uh, basically, in 2019, they only met one time in April. And so with us moving forward with the parks master plan, we want to have continuity on the board. We want to make sure that we have the historical knowledge as well. And so in September the 15th, we would also propose or, or ask council to discuss an extension for some of our current commissioners. Um, again, one of the reasons or a few of the reasons behind that are laid out uh, right here in this PowerPoint. Um, but no Parks and Recreation Commission's meetings were really held in the past year. Um, those who were appointed back in 18 were really only saw two meetings, uh, one in December of 2018, another one in April of 2019, and then our first meeting that we had of 2020 wasn't until June. Um, since that time, we've established a, a more regular meeting, and so we'll ha be having those you know, once per month unless, uh, unless not needed. But again, the continuity of the commission due to the undertaking of our current master plan is one of the biggest reasons why we're looking at changing the bylaws and the code. Um, we do have three commissioners that we would request to extend for one additional term, uh, again, to keep that historical knowledge and continuity within the board. Um, if we did go this route, this would still allow us to keep the current appointment schedule in place. So nothing would be uh, off, if you will, uh, when it comes to their term limits. Could you go to the next slide, please, James? 
Um, these are the individuals that we have on the board currently or on the commission currently. Uh, and they're broken out into, into threes. Uh, the top three aren't, I mean, we, we don't really necessarily have to, to, to worry about those individuals. Those individuals, um, you know, they're basically on the board until next year. Uh, the three that we would be looking at, you know, a possibility of an extension would be uh, Chairperson Lee Keeling, uh, Ms. Repka, and then Vice Chair Mike Rivetta. Um, those three terms expire at the end of September of this year. And again, um, just with being with the Parks Master Plan and, and having, you know, that historical knowledge, we thought that it would be beneficial um, to at least have the discussion with council uh, for a possible extension for those three individuals. Uh, and then the, the following three, um, one that's a vacancy, but the other two were, were basically off of the board as of last year. Um, so we would be looking to, to fill those as well. Um, that, that concludes the, the PowerPoint. Um, if you have any questions, questions. You know, I'm, I'm yeah, feel free to feel free to ask. Jason, I just want to add just to be clear that the reason why eventually we want to have a conversation about the extension is that um, those folks are termed out. And so um, in essence, we would be seeking potential special exception um, to allow some of these folks to continue even after being quote unquote termed out. Um, but we'll get to that when that day comes. Um, and again, just to be clear, today's item is strictly for the code part of it. Um, at the later next meeting or next regular meeting will be the discussion on the bylaws. Um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. If nobody has any questions, I know there's a public hearing component attached to this as well. Well, I'd like to ask Mr. Gush one thing. This is one of the, the uh, entities of the city that uh, falls under the uh, open meetings, open records requirements and train for their members. Is that correct? The training requirement, yes. Yeah. I'm glad you asked about the open meetings requirement. This is an advisory board. We have some of our boards and commissions that don't serve a true governmental function, gotcha. and this is one of them. And so okay. even though that means that the Open Meetings Act itself does not apply, we do have a section in our city code that says that they shall follow the Open Meetings Act. And so I would say that means they need to complete the open meetings training and we would prefer for them to complete the open records training as well. Well, I was just curious about the electronic voting portion. Uh, it wasn't that mentioned. And once this code is over, because we're, some of that may not be allowable. So, so nothing- Yes, sir. Yes. I, I'm glad that you brought that up. You'll see that in many of the uh, bylaws that we're currently bringing to you. Um, it was included in the uh, Tourism Advisory Board bylaws that you just approved. It's right. also approved he included here in the Parks Commission bylaws. I'm including that in most of the boards and commissions yeah. that are advisory in nature and are not strictly following the Open Meetings Act. In fact, that presents me an opportunity to make a recommendation to the council. You remember before that council, I asked that you tweak the code with regard to Robert's Rules of Order because Robert's Rules was not truly binding. It was merely advisory and someone could misread our code as interpreting it to be binding. And so we clarified it to say that it was merely advisory. There's a similar situation about that provision in our city code that says that local boards and commissions that are appointed by city council have to follow the Open Meetings Act. You can't actually make them subject to the Open Meetings Act because the Open Meetings Act contains criminal provisions that are beyond the scope of what a city can create. And so I don't believe that that section is actually operative. I don't believe that it is binding in any way. And so I would recommend that we bring back to council a, a code amendment in the future that clarifies that we expect them to follow the notice requirements of the Open Meetings Act uh, for posted meetings. We right. want those meetings to be open to the public, uh, but they are not subject to the act as a whole, because I think that probably opens the door for it being invalid. Well, I, I need to bring that up to kind of clarify that it, it we're okay moving forward with this. 
and then it's really an advisory board. Right. Okay. So is there any other uh, discussion before I open the public hearing from the presentation? If not, I will now open a public on this matter, item C2. Uh, is there anyone that has raised their hand to respond? No, sir, there are no, uh, no people raising their hands. Okay, and I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion on item C2. I move to approve um, C2. Right. Okay. A motion and a second item C2. Any further discussion? And I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 I believe that takes care of all of the uh, items for public hearing. Let's move on to the consent agenda, please, Mr. Gooch. Yes, sir. There are four items on the consent agenda tonight that will be approved with a single vote. They are first, adoption of the minutes of the council meeting on July 21st, 2020. Second, reappointing members to the Golden Crescent Regional Planning Commission. Third, approving a programmatic agreement with Midcoast Family Services for a community development block grant public facilities expansion project in the amount of $270,000. And fourth is amending the resolution approving the Motor Vehicle Crime Prevention Authority grant to change the identified state statute. I move we adopt the, the Senate agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda. All those in favor, aye. 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 Can we move on into action items, please? Sure. We've already completed item E1, so now we'll take up E2, which is approval of a performance agreement for sanitary sewer installation related to the development of a medical park. We have a presentation. Yes. Can you see it, council members? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Mayor and Council, I'm just delighted to bring this item forward for your approval today. This has been a, a long time coming, and um, we are excited to bring this forward. I believe he is muted. <laughs> hey, Mike, you're on mute, Mike. Sure. All right. So, Mayor and Council, as you know, the 2035 Comprehensive Plan calls for the city to be the medical hub for the region. As such, we are always looking for ways to develop public-private partnerships with medical providers uh, to achieve that goal. In late 2019, Dr. Verma, with Diversified Wellness Associates, approached the city to express his desire to construct a new medical park called Springwood Medical Park Plaza. So the medical plaza is located on 12 acres south of the Detar North Hospital campus. It's near the intersection of US Highway 87 and Nursery Drive. So this map shows you exactly where the medical park will be located where my cursor is. The medical plaza consists of four standalone buildings totaling 90 to 120,000 square feet and it has over 300 parking spaces. The total investment that the developer will have is about 50 to 60 million dollars. The developer is constructing four class A medical facilities and has requested $380,000 in type B sales tax funds to install the sanitary sewer to the medical plaza. Now building one is already under construction. It has 45,000 square feet and it already has access to sanitary sewer. The developer at this time would like to build three additional medical buildings totaling 55,000 square feet, but the facilities need 
a higher capacity sanitary sewer line. So in summary, the sanitary sewer line mayor and council is necessary for completion of this project. The sanitary sewer line will run from the city of Victoria's lift station, which is right off uh, the Zach Lenz access road to the site. The sewer line we think will be a catalyst because it will open up 140 acres for development. You have the Gary Albert Rosenquist property, which has 98 acres. You have the diversified wellness associate property with 41 acres. So again, so again this, sewer line this sewer line will be a catalyst uh, for this area. Now, I also want to point out uh, council that the proposed medical drive is already in the city's thoroughfare master plan and that the medical plaza will generate about $57,000 per year in property tax uh, to the city. So this slide shows the building elevations. In other words, this is what the buildings will look like. The top left building, uh, this building here, is under construction and it's a beautiful building. It has three stories, 45,000 square feet. The total construction cost for this building is about 20 million. The developer already has the property leased up. The remaining three buildings will look like uh, the rendering that you see below on the far left. Mike, you're on, Mike, you're on mute again. So the performance agreement essentially states that the VSTDC shall reimburse or will reimburse the developer $380,000 to install the sanitary sewer line in accordance with these terms. First, the, con uh, the developer will construct three class A buildings comprising of 55,000 square feet by December 31st, 2025. At least 50% of the space or leasable space must be for health or medical health services. The agreement is enforceable up in execution and will terminate at the end of December, 2025. The developer in turn is obligated to dedicate an easement to the city for the sewer line by the end of 2020, construct the sewer line by the end of December, 2021, and complete construction of the medical facilities by 2025. In exchange, the developer has agreed to create 100 new jobs by the end of December, 2025. Um, so we are excited about this opportunity to bring new high paying jobs to the community and there will be new jobs. At least 50% of the new jobs must be medical service providers. In regards to the disbursement of funds the VSTDC will reimburse the developer up to $380,000 after the sewer line has been installed. And in terms of failure to meet obligations, if the developer fails to meet the sanitary sewer line uh, requirements or the deadline, he shall not be eligible for reimbursement from VSTDC. Also, if the developer fails to meet the above job requirements, he shall repay VSTDC a pro rata share of the $380,000 within 120 days notice. The VSTDC board approved this project uh, council at its last meeting on July 27th and staff is recommending approval of this project. Uh, Dr. Verma is on the Zoom and we are both here to answer any questions that you might have.
I move that we accept item E2. Second. Motion and a second to approve item E2. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those same side. Thank you, Mayor. That takes us to item E3, which is authorizing the professional service provider selection for the community development block grant mitigation programs through the general Texas General Land Office. Okay. Do we have a, a presentation? Can you hear me? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yeah. I There's not you. a presentation. Uh, but I was just going to do uh, a little bit of information Katie. about this, um, this item. Katie, if you don't mind, I just want to take a quick second just to uh, verbalize what everybody already knows. Um, Council, you may be familiar that we recently created a grants administrator position. Um, we're funding this partially with some of the COVID-19 reimbursement funds and then splitting the rest of it with a variety of our funds. Um, we identified a need for this position basically because we know that we can do better at centralizing this operation to maximize um, our opportunity for grants. And so uh, Katie, who has been working with legal now, and you're very familiar with obviously because of her involvement with the agenda development process, um, was recently promoted to this position. And so we are excited to have her um, grow alongside with us in this new endeavor. Um, and I hope she's excited as well. And so we figured we would throw her right into the deep end. And so um, she's she's gonna take it in stride and, and, and already present this item for you tonight. And, and again, congratulations, Katie. Yeah, thank you so much. I am very excited. And, and I think it goes with that saying, we wish well in your endeavor. <laughs> thank you very much, Mayor, I appreciate that. Well, this item uh, just really quickly is approving the procurement of administration services for uh, CDMIT program. Um, this RSV, RFP was released um, June 20th and um, staff selected um, using an objective score sheet um, among three applicants. Um, and Trailer and Associates was selected according to that selection committee. Um, another important point about this is that um, this selection is merely confirming um, the, the selection of the, the administrator, but the contract will still be coming back to council for approval. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Connolly? You know, I'll, I'll entertain a motion. Second. Second. We have a, a motion and a second to, to approve item E3. Is there any further discussion? I just want to ask, Kate, this is not the same thing as the regular CDBG. This is part of the, the one that we got through the Texas General Land Grant. Land Grant. Yes. OK. Any further discussion? Hearing that, I'll call for the, all those in favor. Say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Mayor. And before we move on to the next item, I'd like to also add my congratulations to Katie, but also my appreciation for the work that she's done in the legal department over the last six plus years. Um, she has been the backbone of our office. You all know the good work that she did in implementing the iCompass software uh, that we're now using not only for council meetings but across the city. But she's also been instrumental in responding to Public Information Act requests uh, since the time that she got here. She has always done an exceptional job. I'm super proud of her for the promotion she's taken on and I can't wait to see what she accomplishes next. <laughs> Mayor, the next item is item E4 to confirm the city's program for hot funds for outside agencies and appoint members for the Hotel Occupancy Tax Funds Committee. Okay, Mr. Farrell, do you have a presentation? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. As uh, 
we've discussed previously through part of the budget process, the hotel occupancy fund program will be moving out of the legal department and eventually into the Convention of Visitors Bureau, uh, sort of by way of the city manager's office. We're trying to help facilitate that process to make sure that we can kind of maintain and, and preserve some of the good work that, that Thomas and his staff have done, particularly Katie too, uh, that they have done in um, getting this to be such a, such a well-oiled machine. Um, you all have been here for it and, and seen, I think, some of the improvements. So uh, James, if you'll go to the next slide, we'll look at what that process looks like. So in mid-July, we did advertise the program and we did solicit um, applications from those that are eligible. And you may recall that the eligibility process is sort of twofold. One is uh, creating room nights or the, uh, the heads and beds category. And then there are eight other categories that uh, programs and projects could qualify for. Um, on July 22nd and July 29th, we did do applicant workshops and we closed the application period on July 31st. Uh, during that time, we received 16 total applications. The next step is for us to form the hot funds committee that you'll appoint tonight and for us to, uh, to bring back a recommendation from that committee to you on a funding piece. Also tonight, we'll ask you to go ahead and set an amount in the resolution. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide, James, you'll see that um, we have our membership recommendations based on the areas in the tourism industry. Um, and we do recommend $135,000, which is consistent with the previous years um, that, that we've done this. And it accommodates the available fund balance and, it, and the expected revenues uh, in spite of COVID. So we're, we're actually doing fairly well relative to, to the situation uh, that we find ourselves in. So those members that we recommend from the hotel and convention uh, area is Laura Dickey and Brand Brandy Bedford. To represent the arts, we recommend you reappoint George Matthews. To represent history, we recommend you reappoint James Weirden. Um, and for sports, we recommend you reappoint Mike Rivera and Vic Caldwell. Uh, if you should reappoint these members, they will be, they've all uh, indicated an availability to meet between August 10th and August 14th to review the applications that we'll bring back to you later this month. Uh, are there any questions that I can answer? Um, I have a question, would you mind just um reconfirm uh you said despite covid that the you felt like the funds were going to be sufficient to support this same level uh, that that kind of surprised me so i just wanted to verify that that's not requiring cut somewhere else that we weren't aware of yet or how did we get so lucky that is correct um it does not require uh, any cuts or anywhere else. Uh, it's, it's more a function of preparation than luck, I think. Uh, you all as a council have made a decision a while back to ask staff and direct staff to start um, sort of building up the fund balance that would be available in this fund. Um, there's approximately $1.4 million in, in fund balance available uh, for this fund, or we anticipate that there'll be about $1.4 million in fund balance. Sorry, 1.7 million with an expense of 1.4 million. So we've got about a year's worth of, of funds available as a cushion for this. So it will continue to fund CVB. It will continue to fund Main Street. And it will continue to fund this, this sort of delegate agency program that, that we have. Uh, so we are very comfortable with staff recommending $135,000. That does not mean that we won't expect a shortfall in revenues. Uh, but it does mean that we're prepared to, to adjust for that if we need to. Thank you. Eric, that was also, um, uh, many of the hotel stays weren't tourist related then, so they were heavily invested in business related uh, hotel stays or uh, uh, is what we talked about prior. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things I think we've learned from COVID is that while Many of our tourist attractions are struggling and many of our, our tourist 
um, attractions are have been closed even um, our hotel stays have sort of rebounded in a way that isn't consistent with tourist activity so we assume that it's a lot of business activity right thank you and so that and so just really briefly to kind of sidetrack for a second, you know, that obviously then tells us that a lot of our local attractions and what we would consider tourism partners are actually predominantly supported by the local community, um, which is a good thing, um, but also creates an opportunity to improve upon our tourism. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why we wanted to establish the Tourism Advisory Board, because our tourism partners, like the Children's Museum, as an example, and some of our other museums, you know, they recognize that we can do better in actually getting a, a traditional tourist to come to our community. And the COVID experience has taught us that truthfully, we don't have a lot of true tourism um, that comes to Victoria. And so we need to improve upon that, uh, not only for the benefit of our hotels, but obviously some of these businesses um, that they're already suffering. And so we need to diversify that a little better. Any more questions for Mr. Farrell? Being none, I'll entertain a motion. Moved. Second. A motion and a second on item E4. Any further discussion? Being none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same side. Item E5 Thank you. is a a resolution to appoint Gilbert P. Rainey Jr. CPA as the representative to perform the no new revenue tax rate and voter approval tax rate calculation. I move to approve item E5. Second. A motion and a second on E5. Any discussion? Mayor, we have a 10 minute presentation on this item that okay. we want to. I'm just <laughs> kidding. That's well, not I got good news. I was going to ask if not him, who? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'll give you 10 names. <laughs> so hearing no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. same side. Thank you. I <laughs> think mayor is a resolution to grant a variance to section 10-115 and 30-27, which prohibits septic system installations within one mile of the city limits for 200 for an address 280 County Road. So move. Second. A motion and a second on this side of the discussion. I just want to confirm that the uh, version that we're approving uh, does have a condition that the property is ever divided. This variance will not continue. Yes, it does. That, that was added. Thomas added that to the uh, resolution. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I think that's consistent with the previous one we recently approved as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing that, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. I think we do now so, move into the city manager's report. Yes, sir. This evening we have an update from um, our director of development services, Julie Fulgham, and she will present an update on the CDBG um, analysis and talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, COVID allocation, I believe. So Julie, can you take, take that away, please? Yes. Good evening, Council. Um, as Jesus was saying, um, first I'd like to update everyone on our CWG CV funds, which of course were allocated through the CARES Act, and then I'll get into uh, tonight's presentation about the analysis of impediments. But um, for our CWG CV funds, as you know, we were originally allocated $355,567. We allocated 246,500 of that back in June and had 109,000 remaining. Yesterday, we um, did a, a webinar and did an open call to all the nonprofit and eligible agencies um, to open the application process and made the application available. Uh, and again, reminded everyone through the webinar what these funds are used, supposed to be used for, um, what are the limitations for them, 
and opened up that uh, application process. So we are accepting applications now. Our deadline is Friday at 5 p.m. Um, once we receive all the applications, we will, of course, review them and bring back funding recommendations to council um, tentatively at the first meeting in September, September 1st. So hopefully we will have enough applications to expend the rest of the um, funds and continue to um, help people that are dealing with COVID-19. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on our CDBG CV funds if anybody has any. Um, if not, I will move right into our uh, 2020 draft analysis of um, analysis of impediments to fair housing choices. Uh, this is part of our five-year consolidated plan. So we will be asking council to approve this AI um, at the next council meeting as part of that consolidated plan. It will be uh, presented as an appendix to that plan. Next slide, Jean. So the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, um, which we refer to as the AI, is a process that CDBG program of recipients, which we are as an entitlement recipient, uh, must undertake to ensure that we are affirmatively furthering fair housing under the Fair Housing Act. The AI um, assembles fair housing information. So this is unfortunately a very data-driven um, presentation and not the most interesting information, but um, of course it is so very important to our community. Uh, but we take the fair housing information and then we identify existing impediments in our community that limit housing choices. Um, and then also proposes actions to mitigate those impediments. So the first section of the AI uh, provides the in-depth look at Victoria's housing market using our best available data, which is primarily census data, but we do also use a variety of other state and local data sources that you'll see uh, referenced throughout the um, document. Victoria County is um, expected to see a population increase of 11.2% between 2010 and 2020. Approximately 72% of the county's population resides within the city of Victoria. So we assume, uh, based off multiple population models, that we'll continue to see an increase over the next 10 years. And um, that increase is expected to be about 10% between 2020 and 2030. Next slide. So the analysis of impediments looks at income and cost of living for Victoria residents. Uh, the chart shows that in 2018, the majority of full-time year-round workers in Victoria made between $25,000 and $49,999. To better understand the cost of living in Victoria, the table displays, uh, the table on the right displays the cost of living in Victoria compared to the U.S. national average. Uh, the U.S. national average equals 200 in each category. And as you can see, it costs significantly more to rent than to own in Victoria. If you look at the um, chart uh, about halfway down, you can see the difference between homeowner and rental, ho rental housing. Um, and so it's significantly more to rent than to own um, in Victoria. And that healthcare costs are also uh, more than the national average. So, but if you look overall collectively, the cost of living in Victoria is slightly less than the national cost of living. Um, next, we look at housing stock. As the table and pie chart show, single family housing uh, comprise 70% of Victoria's housing stock. The pie chart also illustrates that single family residential building slowed between 2016 and 2018. However, our permits uh, in 2019 show an increase in building permits for single family residential. Although we know that a lot of those building permits that were issued uh, over the last year or two are actually um, mainly attributed to general land office grant funded replacement homes and are not actually um, contributing to an increase in single family residential housing stock um, in Victoria since they are replacement homes that were damaged during Hurricane Harvey. Multifamily housing also increased by 10% between 2010 and 2018 and comprises uh, just under 24% of Victoria's housing stock. So to uh, better understand the cost of owning a home, we use data from the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M. Uh, the 2018 and 2019 median home price um, for Victoria was pulled from the, data, uh, the Real Estate Center. 
So in 2018, the median home price was 173 and in 173,000. And in 2019, it was $189,885, which represents an 8.9% increase in cost. Um, however, U.S. Census data lists the 2018 median home price as 131,000. So we do have some discrepancies in the data, but we believe that the Texas A&M Real Estate Center is a more um, accurate reflection of what the true cost uh, for a median home price in Victoria is. Data from March 2020 shows um, similar median home prices to 2019 and uh, 2018. So in order to demonstrate affordability, the table um, on the right shows the required income and down payment for a potential homeowner in Victoria. Of course, there are 0% um, down uh, housing pro mortgage products out there, uh, but of course they usually associate uh, are associated with much higher cost, overall cost. So next slide. The cost of uh, renting a house, the housing unit in Victoria is also analyzed as part of our AI. The top table shows that the American Community Survey, also known as the ACS, um, five-year estimate data for the median cost to rent in Victoria from 2015 to 2018. And as of 2018, data suggests that 55% of renters paid anywhere from $500 to $999 per month in rental um, in rent. The table at the bottom shows the median rent for Victoria in 2019 and 2020 and the required gross monthly income for a family or household in order to qualify for a rental unit. Um, just for quick reference, uh, $2,586 monthly income uh, roughly equates to uh, $14.92 an hour. Next slide. HUD also provides on a yearly basis the CDBG income limits for the city to determine eligibility for assistance based on family size and income. So these income limits um, also establish the median family income for Victoria. In 2020, the median family income uh, is $68,800. And then additionally, HUD provides the city with fair market rent costs based on apartment size. Uh, and so you see those figures on that chart. When looking at housing affordability, it's also important to analyze the percent of gross monthly income being used to pay for the mortgage. Uh, looking specifically at homeowners only, between 2010 and 2018, the chart shows the percent of gross monthly income um, for Victoria homeowners with a mortgage. And according to HUD, a house becomes cost burdened when a household um, expends 30% or more of their gross monthly income and housing costs. So as of 2018, 26% uh, of homeowners in Victoria were considered cost burdened by their mortgage, meaning they're house poor. Next slide. Um, in comparison, the data shows that renters in Victoria are more likely to have a higher housing cost burden than uh, homeowners with a mortgage. And as you remember back to the cost of living um, index where it does show that it's much higher uh, cost to rent than it is to own. Uh, a household is a, considered extremely cost burden when housing costs equal or exceed 35% of their gross monthly income. And as of 2018, 51% uh, of all renters in Victoria were considered cost burden. Next slide. So for the next part of the analysis, we looked at income data for um, homeowners and renters to determine what is the greatest need for affordable housing or which group um, faces the largest barrier to safe affordable housing. The data shows that there is a barrier to affordable housing amongst mainly renters in Victoria with 49.6% of renters making less than $34,999 per year compared to only 22.5% of homeowners making that same amount. 51% of homeowners in 2018 made between $50,000 and $149,999. So once we go through all of that very interesting data, um, we look at the AI then looks at, um, we identify the impediments to affordable housing. And so the um, impediments that we've identified is a lack of, there's a lack of, of affordable single family housing stock and insufficient um, income, which has an impact of uh, there being a shortage of affordable homes at, at 
or shortage of homes at affordable price points. Um, home ownership and income disparities for communities of color as seen um, in the table below also um, has an impact of loss of future wealth or net worth. And then the lack of affordable rental housing uh, and income uh, has an impact of uh, rising rents being linked to a rise in homeless populations and healthcare problems. Um, another impediment that we discovered is that Victoria has a higher rate of substandard housing structures than the national average. Uh, it's especially true for households that rent and whose incomes fall between the 30 to 50 percent AMI. And the definition of a substandard housing unit is a unit that um, lacks a complete plumbing, a complete kitchen facilities, or has an inadequate or safe so source for heating um, fuel. Victoria also has a higher rate of overcrowded housing units than the national average. Um, this is especially true of renters at all income levels and age groups. The definition of overcrowded housing per HUD is having more than one person per room and considers a household severely overcrowded if there are more than one and a half persons sharing a single room. So to wrap up um, our identification, of all of those um, and impediments that we've identified based off analyzing our, um, our data related to affordable housing, we then lastly address the goals in the AI. So our goals to address real estate impediments are to expand the stock of affordable housing, continue to expand homebuyer assistance programs, reduce living expenses to allow more funds to be available for rent or mortgage payments, um, assist low-income owners with rehabilitation expenses, provide homeowner and financial literacy education for low income populations, support programs that help maintain neighborhood stability, continue to assist low income home, home buyers through the demolition of unsafe or substandard housing structures, and then also continuing um, to assist low income neighborhood stabilization through infrastructure improvements. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, this um, entire analysis of impediments that is uh, required by uh, HUD through the CDG program will be um, attached to our consolidated plan as an appendix, uh, which we will be asking council to approve at the next council meeting. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Julie, did you mention how much money it was going to take or we were going to get from this or how do you support the all this work to be done. So a lot of some of um, these goals will be addressed through our consolidated plan, which of course then ties into our annual action plan, which is that, which is that yearly, yearly funding yearly. process. So for our 2020 allocation, um, you know, if you remember back to the presentation in June where we recommended our 2020 um, funding recommendations, we're receiving $604,000. And so that will all be part of um, what we're going to be asking council to approve at the next meeting. So it's part of yeah, the thousand. Yeah, and, and um, I'll just briefly add too that you know some of these same elements were also identified in the twenty thirty five comp plan. Um, and so and 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 part of what we're trying to do as well as as the city is not. 100% rely on the CDBG funding that we get to help tackle this issue because clearly uh, with some of these figures not trending in the direction that we would like, clearly that is not enough. And so we clearly need to do more about addressing some of these goals. Um, and so that's why you may recall, you know, efforts to look at um, improving, improving workforce housing. You know, you may recall, you know, trying to revive the Housing Finance Corporation, you know, and so there are other elements outside of the CDBG process that, that we're trying to push for to help achieve these goals. Um, but obviously for purposes of the CDBG process, we need to go through this step. Um, but it's a much broader issue outside of the CDBG process that, that we need to try and, and do something about. Well, okay. I can tell you one of the most telling things, I've been to several uh, seminars and, and uh, presentations on uh, this problem and one in particular in, in Victoria and I think Ms. Fulgram you were there as well when they took some of the examples you gave about uh, the amount of uh, rent 
versus a person's income. I think you mentioned $15 an hour is minimum, but they gave some real life examples of, of, of people who told their story and they identified them as person A, B, and C and told real life examples of what can happen to a person when so much of their income is spent on housing. And it's really a telling tale when you see it and what after you pay that rent, what you have left to live on and how you absolutely have no safety net whatsoever for the things that, like a blown tire and things like that. So when you see it in terms like that, it really brings it home to me. And I, I hope that we uh, can make strides in improving these numbers in the coming years. And the analysis of impediments, as, as mentioned, it's an analysis. So when you look through our impediments, you will notice that there are impediments that traditionally a city government is going to have a hard time um, addressing. And so when we look at our, um, when we've analyzed the data and then established what those impediments are, um, the goals are really listed out as things that, that we have a better um, ability to control as far as what is, you know, the, the role of, of the city. And so, um, the impediments, if, like I said, if you're looking at those, they're not necessarily easy fixes, like, you know, um, low wages. <laughs> well, I think, I think what, it, what it does is an overall improvement of our economy in right. terms of job growth and high paying jobs. That's what's going to uh, help solve a lot of these things, which will also improve everybody's lot. Right. But I think, I, think you, you, I, I understand you can't necessarily take care of the problem. It's if we can create a better uh, atmosphere of, of solid economic growth and higher paying jobs, that's going to go a long way to solving some of these problems. Yes. It's kind of like and, and, in some, and in some of these affordable housing and housing that's affordable. So the analysis, the impediments can yeah. be really used across the entire community um, for all sorts of, of different um, you know, programs or policies or initiatives. And then the goals that you see on this slide are really more tied to the CDBG plan. Right, right. Okay, th thank you. Any further presentations, Mr. Garza? Uh, no, sir, that wraps it up. We can, we can go and transition into um, executive session. Okay. Well, it's time we will conclude the regular portion of our agenda and move into executive session. Our meeting broadcast will end and we will take a short break to allow staff time to adjust the virtual meeting as appropriate for the uh, executive session. Uh, members of city council, please remain logged in the meeting and the adjustments will be made uh, by staff to, uh, to take us into the executive session. So with that, uh, our open meeting business is concluded. Thank you. Mayor, we're going to announce